I always found it difficult to remember the five groups of pulmonary hypertension. I learned a memory aid that I want to share with you while I was faculty at Hopkins from one of the residents. I'm not sure who created this memory aid. Why is it important to know the five groups? Well, remember, when you diagnose someone with pulmonary hypertension, that's not the end of the journey. It's the start of the diagnostic journey, similar to when you diagnose someone with iron deficiency anemia or SIADH. You need to understand why. Welcome back clinical problem solvers. It's Prof Rez. I'm a clinician in Chicago who loves learning and teaching. And also I think my lighting skills are improving. I don't look like Casper the ghost anymore. Comment below on how my lighting skills are. Today we're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension with a specific focus on the five groups of pulmonary hypertension. I'm going to teach you a mnemonic that was taught to me by a student of mine so that you never forget the five causes. Before we dive into the five causes of pulmonary hypertension, let's discuss how a patient with pulmonary hypertension might present clinically. This is important because 20% of patients with pulmonary hypertension, it takes two years to get to a diagnosis because the symptoms are nonspecific. The initial symptoms may include fatigue and exertional dyspnea. Why does this happen? Well, if you think about it, the function of the right side of the heart is to take deoxygenated blood, push it to the lungs where it gets oxygenated and then makes its way to the left side of the heart where the left side of the heart pumps the blood to your tissues to deliver oxygen and glucose. But if you have resistance in front of the right side of the heart, it's going to be more difficult to get it to the left side of the heart. So when you're moving around and you need that oxygen and glucose, you're not going to get an adequate supply, which may manifest as fatigue or shortness of breath. What happens as pulmonary hypertension progresses? Well, now the right ventricle will get thick. It'll dilate. You'll have right-sided failure. And it's easy to know what might happen. So you might have volume overload, lower extremity edema, ascites, pleural effusion. You might get an enlarged liver that's tender and pulsatile because of this right-sided failure. Additionally, you may have exertional syncope because you're not getting enough blood into the left side of the heart to pump blood to the brain. So you pass out or you might have exertional chest pain. Pretty much um, the exertional chest pain is because you have increased wall tension due to the changes of the right ventricle. And during exertion, you just can't meet the demand of the myocardial cells on the right side of the heart. Thereby you get subendocardial ischemia and angina. So now that we know how patients with pulmonary hypertension might present clinically, let's talk about the five classes. Because remember, once you frame someone as pulmonary hypertension, your diagnostic journey has just started. So the way to do this, and I'm going to put this on the corner of the screen, is think about the numbers one, two, three, four, and five. And then put a mirror right in front of these numbers. So number one, if you put a mirror and you put another one, this looks like an artery. So group one is pulmonary arterial hypertension. These causes include idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, schistosomiasis, HIV, drugs and toxins like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and connective tissue diseases or autoimmune diseases like systemic sclerosis. Group two, draw a two out, put the mirror, the other two will look like this, this looks like a heart. So group two is due to cardiac disease. Anything that causes left-sided failure can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Group three, imagine the three, the mirror, and you can see it below two, looks like a lung. So group three pulmonary hypertension is due to lung disease. So obstructive lung disease like emphysema, restrictive lung disease like interstitial lung disease, or even severe obesity can lead to group three pulmonary hypertension. Group four, draw out the four, no mirror, just draw it out. It looks like a chair. If someone is immobile, it makes you think of clot. So group four is due to chronic thromboembolic disease, but really anything that obstructs the pulmonary arterial system, like parasites, tumors, can lead to group four pulmonary hypertension. Group five, is everything else, and it, basically we don't know how these causes actually lead to pulmonary hypertension, but doesn't the five look like an S? 
So you can think of sickle cell disease and other hemolytic processes or sarcoidosis. In any case, I hope this is a, a good start or a foundation to your understanding of pulmonary hypertension. As always, work hard today so you're better tomorrow than you were yesterday.